Hello, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Child Chat and Community on Word Palette. I'm Chris Malika Bhadra, and tonight I'm joined by two wonderful young ladies, and we'll be talking about gender objectification around us in our everyday lives. But before we actually jump into the topics and I get my guests to be introduced, I'd like to begin the show by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the peoples of the Kulin Nation. I also pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Without much delay, I have with me Dr. Retika Ravi from Melbourne and Abigail Shrian from Canberra. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me tonight. How are you doing, first of all? Good, Chris, and a pleasure to be in the show with you. Thank you so much for having us over. And I had a correct, uh, Abigail Charing the Lima, although I didn't officially, but that's my husband's last name. So, all right, Abigail. <laughs> yeah, it's not all a right. big deal, but I was like, oh, I just put it on there. Awesome. All right. Um, then, Abigail, I'll start with you. Why don't you yeah. tell us and our listeners a bit about yourself? Okay. Um, well, my name is Abigail Sharing Dalima. I am living in Canberra. I moved from Canberra last year from Sydney. And then before that, I was in the U.S. I was born and raised there uh, for 30-something years of my life. And, <laughs> and well, until 31. So um, yeah, and here I am. I I work as a counselor right now, uh, and um, for crisis. And um, yeah, I guess I'm Indian. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, whatever else you guys want to know, you can ask me. I guess along the way. I will. Don't worry. I'll ask you a lot of questions. Rika, <laughs> <laughs> um, coming on to yourself. Please tell us about yourself. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Ratika Ravi. I work as a lecturer at uh, Victoria University here in Melbourne. I've been in Melbourne for 21 years, so Melbourne is home, definitely. Um, apart from that, I am the artistic director of Shakti Swara School of Dance, where I teach Bharatanatyam. Um, apart from dancing, which is my passion, which I've been doing for 30 plus years now, I enjoy singing and I do quite a few concerts um, in and around Melbourne and in India. Love painting. I like to play the Vina. I have a five-year-old who keeps me super busy. And yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> oh my God. That, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was counting when she was saying, I have this, I have this. I was like, OK. <laughs> OK, well, I do some um... my paintings behind in the background, so yeah. Oh, I see it. I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, I do, I do, I just started doing some um, uh, radio announcing or presenting recently. Yeah. So, uh, but that that's um, just uh, some volunteering. So we'll see how, where it goes from there. It will go great. I'm yeah, sure. I'm sure it will go great. Yeah. All right. Um, so Rebecca, I'll start with you. Um, sure. Tell us if you've ever experienced uh, any sort of gender objectification in specifically the academic industry. Has it ever happened around you or to yourself? Tell us about your experiences. Well, see, um, I've actually never um, worked in India because I came here at a very early age. And um, uh, I've worked in completely two different industries here. One is the medical field. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is the educational and training sector. Yeah. Fortunately, I, I, you know, I must say that uh, I haven't really faced any gender objectification personally, but um, I have seen it happening around me. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen it happening, you know, indirectly to colleagues, to friends. I've heard stories. Um, but uh, from my own personal experience, um, I was, for about five and a half years, I worked at um, a naturopathy uh, college in the city, a very well-known place. And um, I was the only woman in the team for nearly five and a half years. Uh, initially, when I started, I, I was like, will I be able to pull this off? Because everybody was older to me. All the men in the team were older. Of course, we were all from different ethnicities, different backgrounds. Uh, but it actually worked well. It, it turned out to be one of the most enriching experiences of my life. Um, there was a lot of 
respect. There was a lot of empathy. There was a lot of flexibility, um, a lot of conversation. We've traveled together. We've had conferences together. And, um, you know, it, it was one of the best experiences, um, especially in the academic arena where yeah. you find more men than women. Yes. And yes. something that I learned end of the day, because I, I resigned my job and I felt pregnant. And, um, you know, uh, something that I took back as my own message was, um, I think a woman's career with respect to any field, be it academics or any field, is not just limited to her educational qualification or, you know, professional achievements. I think it goes way beyond that. It is looking at her life as a whole. Yeah. Because I think unlike men, women have to work harder in building healthy social relationships or yes. healthy social networks. Um, she has to work through a work-life balance because women, you know, have children during their career, the so-called paternity leaves, I mean, sorry, maternity leaves, everything. So she has to try and tackle all of that, um, try and tackle the influences, the recognitions, you know, the responsibilities that come along with it. So it's, um, I think if we look at it as a learning experience um, and something that helps us build upon ourselves, where do you want to be in your professional arena? Do you want to carve a niche for yourself? Are you going to maintain your integrity, your personality, um, and whatever values you've grown up with, irrespective of whichever field you're working in, exactly. be it modeling, be it academics, be it uh, you know corporate jobs, anything. I think um, she alone is, uh, you know, she alone can do mm. That's right. And um, I think uh, personally for me, um, you know, what I would say is for a woman, allow your work to talk for yourself rather than anything else. And, you know, you, the respect will come through no matter what, you know. So, Absolutely. yeah, in fact, I was yeah. just reading an article about a week back, coincidentally. It's called Men and Their Work. Um, it's available on PubMed. It's from a 1950s paper. And the original paper is in French. But, of course, we do have the English version available. It's amazing. Whatever, you know, the author had to say at that point in time, it actually holds true even today, which is, you know, even, even I don't know if you, if you ladies have seen the recent series on Netflix called The Chair. It was mm -hmm. funny in its own way, but it showed the actual way a woman, the struggle she does to get to the chair of an academic society, the struggle she has to do just to beat mm -hmm. that competition among her male peers. It was funny, but it was very ironical and something I could relate to. Um, mm -hmm. Abigail, coming on to you quickly so um have you experienced any such examples or influences of gender object objectification around you in your industrial career so far oh i'm a newbie in my career but i mean overall um yeah i mean in, in definitely in different ways i think also um it, it's interesting like for me i i have a list and I think for people, even professionally, think it's a cute thing because I'm a female. Hmm. But men get, but it's, but but it's something that a man would probably get discriminated by. But for me, I get labeled cute, but not in a way that I'll be taken seriously. Hmm. So it wouldn't hinder a man from progressing. But but for me, I feel like I almost because I'm a, a woman and I look youth, like quite young for my age, even though I'm much older than I appear, it, it I don't get taken seriously. Um, I think people just seem to think that, um, yeah, like you're, you, they assume that you're young and you don't have enough experience and they don't recognize, you know, you, you could have been working for 15 years at this point. And I don't think men experience that type of discrimination. Mm, well, that's, that's, interesting. that's interesting. So. Yeah. The other question that comes from here is when you say that people think you look cute and you look younger to your age. So what does that gaze actually mean? Like, what does the male gaze mean? And 
how is that different from a female gazing at a male? If that yeah. kind of yeah. how is that well, different? How are the two gazes different, Abby? Yeah. Oh, I mean, a lot of things are run by the male gaze, right? Hollywood and social media and it look all these fortune 500 companies are when you know they're all they're all men uh, mostly men i wouldn't say all no. um a lot of things you know it, you can tell even a lot of work environments don't really have a female touch to it very kind of cold you ever heard that um you know like kind of uh the comparison to like being in a hospital it's like cold it's a dull offices are cold and dull but i think that's also because men were always in a position of power and mm. so i think if more women were in those positions and upper level management or whatnot you would see a difference in the way even our work environments are and the way they're run and you know like i said i mean uh, look yeah. the objectification is yeah, exactly. everywhere in many faucets of life so i mean yeah it's it's definitely yeah i mean you can see the evidence of the male gaze in a lot of life i mean now we're starting to be empowered where women are you learning you know using social media more mm -hmm. and looking look at the platform you have right now like as an indian woman that's massive yeah. and you know you don't you know, even educated women, actually there are more women in university than there are men. Yeah. Isn't that That's funny? Yeah. But yet women don't get promoted as much as yeah. men. Yeah. Women are actually more qualified now and still won't get the pay or the positions of a man that's underqualified in comparison mm -hmm. to her. So it, it is a common problem regardless of you or faith or anything and i mean i firsthand experienced that throughout my employment since my 20s i was not taken seriously you know i look young and but i know a man who had appeared young or had a, a list like i did or do would not be discriminated against in terms of getting employment yeah but i think in terms of like uh, how do you say being made fun of or something guys guys would get that whereas women you're cute but we won't take you seriously yeah. but that makes sense yeah yeah makes sense yeah Rebecca, coming on to you quickly before we move on to the next part how, how do you think these two gazes differ like do you think there's a difference between the male gaze and the female gaze i think there is because you know with the male gaze we could keep talking about it for hours but i think with the female gaze it's it's more um it comes out of empathy and it's not to create some sort of a power imbalance here mm -hmm. and um, a gaze could mean many things the gaze need not be just looking at somebody it could even mm -hmm. be passing a simple sarcastic comment which can mm -hmm. break down the other person's confidence or self-esteem you know yeah. or interfering or asking questions about the woman's personal life for instance mm -hmm. um, it could be you know um yeah. uh, yeah, so I, I think the word gay is not only, uh, I don't think we should just stick it to just the looking part of it or the personality part of it. It's much more beyond that. But I, as Abigail said, I think um, women are very strong. They are much more stronger than men. I think nature has gone around and proved it, um, you know, and uh, I think we have the grit and the willpower which men lack completely. <laughs> So, it's not that we don't love men either. <laughs> we, we, we love we, our men. We are, yeah, yeah. We, we have this very sensory perception. And I think we think we are trained or I don't know if it's nature or what, what to say, but I think we are trained to become some sort of an all-arounder way we think from the heart and from the head and yeah. don't get carried away. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and it's not that we put only others in front of us and don't you know, think about self-care. Of course, all of us do. We do have our little me times every now and then. And um, yeah, I think we are um, definitely, as far as mental strength goes, I think we are far ahead than men. And, uh, you know, and gaze is not just the 
looking part of it it's it's even the entire simple things it could be mm-hmm. simple things like not opening the door when a woman goes in the front or you know uh, maintaining that so called courtesy it could mean even simple things like that which goes a long way it's it's basic mm-hmm. courtesy leave alone saying ladies first you know end of the day it's simple courtesy to say okay you go ahead or have a seat or things like that so anybody think, can open a door for someone exactly that's right that's right it need not be a man doing it for a woman or vice versa it's just um human nature it's just basic courtesy Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think in the mutual respect and the courtesy part right. need to be there in both the sexes. I mean, in all the sexes. So yes. that's where the minute you don't have it, there's this disparity. And as Abigail mentioned earlier, there's this gender pay gap, right? Which yeah. a lot of people are talking about. I'll I'll like to come back to pay gap later. But before I want to know that. All right. So that's my mom, right? So great topic. Hello. Thank you. Thank Hello. You um. Hi, so. I want to know the next thing that I want to know is how does this whole cycle of objectification affect an individual's mental and emotional health because the reason I asked this question also is because October is the mental health awareness month in all over Australia so how does objectification affect us on a mental level Radhika I'll start with you first and then I'll come on to you Abigail See um I think it can affect people in a very very big way in a very wrong way it can lead to you know i i come from the medical field so i've mm-hmm. seen that happen i can you know make people become very anxious it can cause depression um it can lead to some sort of a psychological trauma because um not everybody can handle stress in the same way yeah. and for you know it, it, it's very subjective some people may be able to take it in their stride move on and that a lot depends on how they've been brought up what they've been exposed to what kind of a background they've been growing up in and are living in whereas there are so many people who can get upset with just um you know sarcastic comments or uh something as simple as that which can completely break their confidence level and mm-hmm. can in turn lead to you know low productivity of their work or whatever and uh, it's not easy for everybody to handle it uh, in fact one of the most common things uh, a woman of indian origin gets asked is the minute you are in the 20 25 bracket oh are you still single when are you getting married the minute you get married trust me the minute you get married in a month or two, oh so when are you having kids all right kid number 1 comes oh aren't you planning for a second child all right in between all this if you go ahead and do something you know it's like oh that's why things are getting delayed you know these are very very common comments that most of us and most of the women would have heard irrespective of wherever she lives yeah mm-hmm. and i've seen not just my friends of indian origin i've seen you know people my friends of other cultures get asked very similar questions and um, end of the day it's her life you know it's her decision it's her partner's decision or the family's decision and i think we need to respect that but at the same time i think we've all come a long way there was a time when probably my great grandmother or my grandmother never had the opportunity to study abroad or to have a career on their own whereas mm-hmm. today all of us are sitting here in this talk show discussing about something as wonderful as this so we have come a long way but i think mm-hmm. we still have a long way to go Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very aptly put, Radhika. Um, moving mm-hmm. on to you, Abigail. How do you think this whole cycle of, you know, objectification affect an individual's mental health? Yeah. I mean, uh, such a big topic. Uh, well, I would say, um, look, even adding on to what Radhika said about um, even women being asked the question about fertility, you notice that when, even when women Um, are not don't have the fertility issue they are always pointed as the one who is because they carry the child a lot of people don't realize even habits that the man has can affect the outcome of or you know of mm. the, of the child right the the um effects can be seen in the children as well and that's never pointed out it's always 
the woman. If the woman can't have kids, it's the woman. If there's abnormalities, it's the woman. If a woman could be in her 40s and have a very healthy child, right? But of course, with age, it does it, it does increase that there will be abnormalities. Yeah. But what if it was the man? No one will ever suspect that, right? They'll always assume it has to be the woman. She's in her 40s. But that's not necessarily true. There are many situations where it was the man. You know, so I think that it's interesting. Yes, you know, we do have the biological clock situation, but that doesn't necessarily mean every woman's eggs and at 40 something is going to have abnormalities. The, the male sperm can also be in that mm-hmm. same position. So mm-hmm. I think it's, yeah, I think it's interesting that, yeah, it always falls on the women. Um, Look, it, it, it does affect you psychologically. You can see that in so many faucets and social media and TV. I mean, there's a beauty standard that is, is impossible to, to attain. You know, the whole symmetrical face. I definitely don't have a symmetrical face. I can't speak for anyone else. So apparently I'm not, you know, in that sense, ideal, right? But ladies, I want to kind of stop you here and ask that, don't you think this objectification is applied to males too these days? Like men have a certain standard of how they want to be looked at, how they want to, you know, how many men have, I've heard men saying that we get judged based on our paychecks, if we have a house, et cetera, et cetera. So don't you think that yes. the general empathy yes. in both the sex is lacking? So what yeah. are your thoughts quickly, Aretika? It's It's increasing these days a lot. I've heard that often, you know, you're always judged by whether, like you said, by your paycheck, what car you have, or do you have an own house, or where do your children go to, you know, why these questions? Um, mm-hmm. So everything is based on something like a chart where you the keep the thing. And if one of the boxes is missing, it's like you get a second look. And, you know, it's, I find it weird personally, especially living here, having studied here, working here you know i find it amazing when um i hear these questions or when i see these questions floating around it makes me think what are we doing you know and Mm -hmm. just to add to what abigail said yes uh with respect to a woman's fertility fortunately or unfortunately most of the times it's always a woman who is asking the question to the other woman and Mm -hmm. i wondered why you know, shouldn't you be standing by my side? Shouldn't you be supporting me? Why question? You yeah. know what I mean, right? And I'm sure all of us would have faced this at some yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. All right. We have some comments. Bharani says, interesting topic. Thanks, Bharani, for watching and tuning us. Thank you. Thank you, and yeah, Thank you for watching. My okay. Hello, Uncle. And thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. All right. Um, please keep asking more questions if you guys are watching us. All right, let's move on to the other thing, right? So talking about a general household, like Retika, you are a mother, Abigail, you're married. Do you ladies think that when we objectify certain tasks that this should be done by the woman or the mother, this has to be done by the father, does this whole cycle affect the household dynamic? What are your views on that? Abigail, I'll start with you first. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it's known that the women typically take on the mental load of the household. And that's Mm -hmm. a topic that's been um, mentioned time and time and again, especially in recent years, that not only do we have a student role or an employee role, but then you have the mother role. Then you also have to do the cooking, the cleaning and stuff. Whereas a man, he's typically working, maybe fixes the car and mows the lawn, but that's not a daily task. That's, you know, of course, they were. It depends on the dynamic, right? The traditional role would be the man would be focused on the bills and things like that. But women, we think about the things in between, right? Like the little things. And so we think, like, even if you plan an event, right? We're, we're thinking of all of the details in daily life. We think about all the details. Like, we don't want to miss a step. So I feel like, yeah, I mean, women carry a lot of that mental load that, yeah, yeah. you know, like every day. Every day we're thinking, you know, we're trying to prevent things from going wrong, making sure everything is, you know, in its place, in its order. Like every little thing. I'm not saying a man can't do that either. I'm saying I think for some reason we have that, we put that burden on ourselves. Mm. Society has put that burden, you know, 
societal conditioning in some sort. You know, we we, may, we we were made to believe that we have to pick up the, you know, pick up the slack in some way, right? With the children, if something goes wrong or if someone gets sick, it's always run to mommy, you know, rather than both parents, yes. right? It's, or run to your wife if the husband, you know, typically the, the female will look up ways to, Mm. You know, cure, well, they cure, but how, you know, yeah. believe an ailment of some sort. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, well, that right there, I mean, you can mm. just see that in any family dynamic. The it's women, so if they want to work and, and, and study, they don't have the option to be, how do I say this? Um, they can't do it all, even if you want to. Mm. Mm. Woman. <laughs> yeah. They, they tell you you can, but when you start to do it, when you, especially if you try to study while you work and you're even working part time and and you're a, a spouse alone, then you, you add children. It It's like, yeah, I mean, and I'm not speaking, obviously, Ritika can talk about that from a mother's perspective, but it's you can see that with anyone you know. It's like they have to sacrifice a lot more. Exactly. Whereas a man, he kind of doesn't have as much to sacrifice if he wants to pursue his dreams or goals or mm. hobbies mm. it's not going to be on the back burner yeah totally i'm yeah. um, revika before i ask that question to you i'll add on to something i was recently watching this ad or rather um observation by a woman she says every time i feed the kid i am able to feed the kid perfectly fine but every time my husband feeds the kid He's saying, oh, the kid is crying. I can't feed him. He's not eating it. How am I able to do it exactly properly while my husband has these issues? I want to know your thoughts since you are bringing up a young child. How do these mindsets affect the dynamic and the dynamic with your child? How does that affect the entirety of the situation? See, I think um, as a husband and wife, it's okay if you're on separate pages. But I think as parents, it's very important to be on the same page that lays the foundation for your child's well-being whatsoever, irrespective of the family composition or ethnicity or location or whatever, you know, so many other variables. And um, I think um, I've got to play all the roles and uh, I've had the support of family because I did my PhD after I got married pretty much two years after I got married, which is kind of unheard of in a South yes. Indian so-called traditional Hindu family. You know what I mean, right? I, I, it wasn't it wasn't an easy thing, but um, yeah, it, it wasn't impossible either. So, um, you know, I've had the support of my parents. I've had the support of my husband. Um, and um, you know it, Chris, PhD takes quite a bit of time, dedication. You miss out on a so-called social life. And I what is social life? What is social <laughs> life, exactly. And, but once you have a child, once you become a mother, the entire dynamics within you changes. You mm -hmm. stop for, for, for many, many things. You put your child first. You, you know, you make sure everything is prepared, everything is ready. Even if you miss a cup of tea or coffee, it's okay, but you want to make sure the child is eating. And I think if you set things right from day one in the sense, okay, I'm happy to do all this, but you do all this, a 50 piece sharing, yeah, things will go smooth. But there are times when you'll have to work, when you have to go in for a meeting. Um, that's when the support of your immediate family, like parents yeah. or extended family, like even friends, siblings, anybody comes into the picture. Yes. Um, having said that, I think I've been blessed because I've got my parents here with me and I've got their entire support. Karthik understands as well. And thanks to lockdown, I've been working from home pretty much for the last two years. So it's an entirely different scenario. You know, I'm always around. Um, and I have seen a few of my friends who have fallen pregnant during this time, have had their babies, unable to bring family over, absolutely no help at all. But husband and wife has managed. They have pulled it. You know, they have sailed yeah. through it. So yeah. it is possible. Uh, probably the husband may not have reacted the same way if the girl's parents were here. But I can see that 
calming you know i can see that uh, compatibility that balance happening um i should say thanks to covid maybe that's one of the positive things that has happened um mm. so as long as there is clear communication a good level of understanding because children don't come with a manual right um, it's very unpredictable with a child in a house and there is no set rules to follow it's just the way the day unfolds and you have this understanding that you do this i do that you don't come in my my way and neither will i come in your way things do work out you know i think it just depends yeah uh i uh, i have a comment to show but before that quickly rate okay all right um so it says jitendra says there's a video doing the rounds on facebook saying only children women and old people are loved unconditionally men are always loved for what he brings to the table personally speaking i don't agree completely with this just just to a part of it but would love to hear the panel's comments all right thanks jitendra for watching keep yeah. getting the questions um all right panel Abigail, your thoughts first, yes. and then I'll move on to Rebecca. Um, yeah, I, 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 I disagree with that for the most part about um, women being loved unconditionally. Well, we're also object objectified a lot, so I mean, I don't know if that's love. Um, and we get blamed for a lot of things, uh, that might be, like fertility. Uh, but um, I can see that a man a man can feel like their self-worth comes from what they bring, you know, paycheck or maybe mm -hmm. even um, status, you know, um, you know, what their level of, you know, like the manager level or what wherever they are, they are in their career mm -hmm. um, that I can see in terms of bringing something to the table. Maybe they're even their handyman work, you know, things like that that are not as much based on who they are and their their nature yeah. and yeah. their character and things like that. So um, yeah, I do hear that a lot of men do feel the pressure of of living up to the expectation of like being successful, whatever that means, right? Like like financially, right? Yeah. And, um, yeah, and like even now, there's a, a common trend now where there are stay-at-home dads coming. It's not as obviously as much as the women. I mean, let let's be real. The women are the ones that are going to have to sacrifice their education or their career, especially also homeschooling has been on the rise. Correct. Um, yeah. So now more women definitely are at home homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, but I do see that there are men starting to do support their wives in the career role and which is and there's one thing that's really good is that now they're swapping like 50 50 for instance like uh, one person will say i'll give you 10 years to be what you want and then the next 10 years it's like they're going to support the woman or vice versa hopefully you can try to do it at the same time but that's like i said it's impossible it is harder for the woman to have it all have the hobbies yeah. have the education you know continue to study be employed be a mother and also, if you're the type that wants to do homeschooling as well, it's you got to give up something. It is a challenge. Radhika, your thoughts on the question that just came through? See, I think with one thing that differs is I think men face a lot of peer pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think women don't get that carried away with it. That is one thing, um, you know, I, I completely uh, have seen, I've felt it myself um there's a lot of not more social responsibility because of that pressure because of that influence on men yeah. um with women i mean it's a it's a well-known scenario that once you have a baby you're going to go on maternity leave but the amount of work i mean not work but the amount of things you do during the day during that one day of leave is a lot it's much more than a nine to five job yeah. you know you're yeah mentally emotionally physically being responsible for a little one and that's mm -hmm. not easy as well so and uh, cooking and clean and cooking is like can you imagine coming up with two to three meals every day you know, of course you can imagine that but i work for the the ones that don't do that that's a lot of work that's the mental load yeah but uh, i mean like i mentioned earlier things have changed a lot i mean if you take you know, the cinema industry, for instance, there was a time when uh, 
say an actor who was in the peak of her career would get married and never be seen again for a good few years and would return as an aunt or a mother to the same actor whom she paired up with right yes. but today yes. that scenario has completely mm. changed mm. and it's nice to see that change happen you know that's what we want in every field that's what we want every time in every sector yes. but um, in a in a real life scenario it is a challenge to balance everything around you um especially with you know women who are prone to facing menopausal problems who have a monthly period it's not going to be easy it takes a toll on her emotionally as well she needs a break too but um, you know the it's it's improving in a lot of places and it has to improve in a lot more homes so yeah mm -hmm. um we have again Jitendra writes that there is no doubt that a woman's life is the toughest one. Just the number of roles a woman has to play in her life itself can terrify a male, at least me. The men, on the other hand, face problems that are different kind. Comments like so and so guy got promotion. When will you get one? Do you know what he took his wife for his European holiday? We never go abroad. So and so guy answers. Such comments are very hurtful, especially comes from the wife's family. Thank you, Jitendra. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah. yeah, so as we were saying, that empathy lacks on both sides, men get objectified too, yeah, for various do. reasons. The reasons are just different, but men do. Yes. So, Jitendra, we feel the pain, men do get objectified, we feel that empathy is lacking on both sides, but in different ways, definitely different yes. ways, in different ways, yeah. Or, right. oh, one second, I think there's a question. Yeah, I'm, yeah. So he writes, Dr. Retika, ma'am, the more you talk, the bigger fan I'm becoming of yours. Thank you, Jitendra. Please keep watching. All right. That's why she was the doctor in front of her name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's one more comment coming. I'll show it right now before. Okay. My mom writes, sorry to say, women are always judged as a wife, daughter, in law, mother, also compared with other ladies. They have to face tough mm -hmm. times every mm -hmm. single minute. Yes, mom, you're right, as always. <laughs> yeah. uh, one quick question that's been on my mind before I move on to the next segment. Ritika, you mentioned that you've seen a lot of your friends who got pregnant during COVID times and then the yes. husband came on the table to help. So does that mean that it took us a difficult pandemic to get the men out of their comfort zones to get them? what they were forced to say? I felt that too. I, yes. I, I was actually talking about it to family and I said, so it actually took a pandemic for men to do all this because, you know, whatever we've seen so, so far is as soon as the woman falls pregnant, the parents come or the in-laws come, they stay throughout, help throughout you know, do all the teaching, the basic work and everything. But now um, it's just he and she. So the he can do, is capable of doing. All right. It's not impossible for that person. And it's it was nice to see it. But unfortunately, it did take a pandemic. Yeah. At least one good use of the pandemic. If it makes sense. Uh, thank you, Jitendra. It's just Manjusha is my mom. So I'll convey your comments to I'm sure she can watch your comments and so thank you for that. All right, moving on to the next segment that's important. We'll again get back to the industrial side of things. I want to talk about the pay gap, which is obvious. Everybody talks about it. Why do we think we have the pay gap when both the female and the male colleagues are equally compatible for a role? Why do you ladies think there's this pay gap and why are we still talking about it in the 21st century? Abigail, you, yeah. I'll let you go first and then I'll come on to Rebecca. Okay. Well, look, I mean, one, I mean, now you have the most, I mean, the, the largest number of women now are educated going to university. Like I said, more women are in university than men right now. But um, I also believe we've been, we're kind of in a way societal conditioning of some sort <laughs> of not really asking for what they want. Mm. Uh, we were always conditioned in a way uh, to be polite and to, uh, you know, not, let's say, rattle any feathers as a term, not to cause a scene. Um, you know, you have to be, you know, we have that, you see Bollywood images of how women are portrayed, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we're very meek and, you know, quiet and, you know, you're not, you don't speak much. You're not that intelligent. Not that that's true, but you know, like where our intelligence 
was mostly based on what we did in the kitchen, like cooking or child care, you know, that was how it was. And um, yeah, I think even now, I think women um, may not be taken seriously everywhere um, when they do speak up. Maybe they don't, like I said, um, I think it is harder for women to ask for what they want because it was something that we weren't really trained at a young age to really do. Yeah, yeah. It's so a conditioning. Just, yeah. yeah, and we just accept whatever we get. And if we do ask, it's, you know, it's like, okay, we don't get it. We probably still hold on to the position. You know, it's not like we're going to quit. And because for us, you know, we may not get a job that's as great as the one that we have, or, you know, like it, it's based on, you know, if you have a job that you're really content with. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like women hesitate to, to act yeah. on anything that they want to do. And yeah, but Slowly but surely, we're being, becoming more empowered and we'll come exactly. to a place where we won't be intimidated by yes. anything or anyone and we'll still continue to pursue our goals and be promoted to that. where we can go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, Rithika, moving on to yourself, uh, why are we still talking about a pay gap based on gender in the 21st century? Why is this deficit still happening? I would echo what Abigail said. I think there was a time when you know, um, we we were we were we were told that okay, you be polite. You know, accept what comes your way, and that was maybe 20, 30 years back. But I think yeah. now the scenario has changed quite a lot from what it was. Women are standing up for themselves everywhere. We do have a voice, be it at work or in the household. I think there's a lot of respect coming our way as well. Um, Industry standards are going to vary depending upon, you know, which sector the woman is in. And mm -hmm. that has always been the case, um, yeah. whether it's, you know, whichever field or whichever scenario you're working for or your your domain area, if I can call yeah. it that way. And the, the so-called stereotype of women, you know, is now um, different. You are allowed to do what you want to do. You are allowed to follow your passions or go on a girl's night out and nobody's going to question you or look at you in a weird way. Um, but see, I mean, um, a lot also depends on um, what, what kind of an image you want to project uh -huh. yourself to be. I think that mm -hmm. is very, very important, end of the day. Um, and that that is everything about you, your identity. How do you want to be? You could, like, for instance, uh, talking about myself, um, I won a sari for all my workplace meetings, important meetings for my graduation ceremonies. Never once have I been asked, why not, you know, why you know, why you in a sari or why not something else? So I think it's the way you project yourself everywhere, wherever it is, to whoever it is. And I think the industry now needs to stand up and take note of the amount of work you're putting in. Um, you know, needs to start recognizing the your IQ levels, your intelligence levels, and not just the personality or where you come from. It's also the work that you're going to be putting in. And I'm, I'm just hoping that things will change for the better from what it is now, because things have changed. So things will change for the better. But when yes. you say that it depends on me, oh, okay, we have a comment, sorry. Uh, okay, Swaminath Aya says, there's no one formula fits all in this. Each family has to tackle the situation in their own way, depending on the personalities it all and play forward. It all depends. But no harm in having a general discussion on the topic. It may help. Thank you, sir. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm. Please keep asking more questions if you feel yeah. um, well, like. What, what Ritika said, um, look, I, I agree that things are changing, but I, I do still think overall there are still a lot more women than men that have trouble speaking up based yes. on the culture yes. they come up. So I agree that things are changing, but I still think, uh, yeah, more women need to come to a place and, you know, really empower each other to be That's able right. to speak up for what they want. And I have another query for both of you ladies. Like, Ritika, you just mentioned that it depends on me how I want to portray myself. If I am demanding an equal pay for my role, which my male colleague is getting paid, Will I be portraying myself as be, being over ambitious or outspoken? Does no, that I don't think so. I think you're just, um, uh, you know, you're confident enough that you deserve that. 
you know mm -hmm. if if you are going to stand up and say speak to hr or something about it you are confident of your work you know that you're going to deliver what the other person can so you're in no way inferior to the other person with respect to your work or with respect to your profession and that's one of the reasons why you feel that you should be recognized pay wise on a on a similar platform mm -hmm. so i don't think it should be looked upon as a way of being over ambitious or you know being too um, uh, too much into your career or things like that it simply means you're just confident of the work that you can deliver true 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 all right um ravi shriram sir says great topic wonderful panelists thank you sir thank you for watching um she said in my view one of the root cause of objectifying others can be the certainty the known situations offer for example a woman getting arrived by 25 and having kids before 30 offer a certainty of settling versus women who chooses a career over marriage remain single we probably lost somewhere the point that change is life and uncertainty is life the life's most important flavor time for being more open and view life as life thank you shri thank you so much for that comment please keep watching and ask questions i think he's made a very good point that we kind of brand people and then we set benchmarks on them those people and we start comparing mm -hmm. case by case which needs to change obviously i think a lot more open mindedness would help but that also depends where you are what you're doing whom you are with uh, you know the society the the environment around you has a huge impact on whatever you do end of the day so i think being open minded you know take paramount importance this will take time ladies i mean you have to agree with yes. me on this this is a time yes. thing you can't yeah. just yeah. blink our eyes and imagine that tomorrow all will be fair there will be no objectification yes. it'll be, it'll well, be well, I, yeah well I, i'll say on one example recently actually there was a, a reality sing competition and hmm. they showed the coaching I, i won't name the show but basically the one of the coaches mentor said the the woman who actually did not have a the vocal report not as great um but he stated that she was the ideal person to be launched in a singing career whereas mm. the woman that was clearly very talented and had the vocal ability above way above the other contestants you know on the show they they didn't allow her to move forward and pretty much it was it was clear it was based on looks but a male would be judged on his vocals yeah women are still objectified in a lot especially in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. if a woman yes. does not look quote unquote attractive and according to the society that they live in you, wh whatever that is in their culture they they don't move forward in anything in on a public platform in terms of entertainment and that's really clear look at everybody who's a celebrity how many of them are the women are when i say attractive but you know of course according to the stereotype of having symmetry and all this stuff, you know however they uh, define attractiveness yeah. and, and also women are more slim um you know like i i got pressure not on men if men can sing well and act well they're getting roles it's not yeah so i yeah so but i'm not saying men can't be objectified obviously there's men you know that have to be muscular for certain roles but i notice overall women are expected to have more of the aesthetics like that's emphasized greatly in comparison to the men yeah, i understand um we have a question from ravi sir with said who says with all this does women have challenges in personal branding thank you sir for watching um ratika would you like to answer that first and then we move on to abigail i think they do have challenges in personal branding because a lot comes you know in their way to tackle um especially with you know what abigail said in the entertainment industry you are expected to have a size zero body shaming happens you know i've had some some people come and ask me oh i'm i'm a little bit on the healthier side can i dance should i dance will it look odd i mean dancing for instance is not about your personality it's about your interest your aptitude towards that form of art it's not about whether you have a perfect hourglass figure there it's about how you're going to 
you know, express a story through that particular art form. So I think women do face a lot of challenges in personal branding almost on a daily basis, or whether it's, you know, in work or at home or whatever they do, you know, it's, it's very important. Um, we've been, I wouldn't say trained, but we are so used to the thought of looking presentable wherever we go or um, speaking in a certain way so that people, you know, understand you and things like that. But um, it's, it's not difficult to tackle those challenges if you know what if you believe in yourself if you're doing what you're doing with integrity and if you believe that you're doing things the right way and not to impress others or to please others then it's fine you know if we can walk through that road it's fine Agreed. i think the same happens with men who are in the performing arts sector because i had my teachers and since they have this physique they dance right those men are often seen as feminine or they're deemed as like, you know, very That's not really muscular. That's really another really. objectification that we have to get rid of. That person yeah. is a performer. Please respect him for that art. Don't just go by the yeah. music. That's right. Um, That's on the point of wrapping up, ladies. So the last question that I want to add is, is there any possibility or do you guys see any examples of a positive objectification? And with this, we'll wrap up the conversation. Abigail, your thoughts first. Uh, oh, that's a hard one. Um, I don't know, because, you know, you're, well, what is objectification, right? You're dwindling someone to being a mere object. Hmm. Um, so it doesn't sound good. <laughs> uh, but what some people will say romantically, um, it might help in certain ways. Yeah. But once again, you're li limiting that to um, the sexual sexual side of things, sexualize, you know, sexualization yeah. of women. Um, yeah, but you know, I don't, I, I don't see how ob objectifying can yeah, really be on a positive note. But you know what? Maybe Dr. Rafika can <laughs> enlighten all of us. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I definitely feel there is a possibility of um, looking at this in a much more positive manner, whether it is towards a woman or towards a man. End of the day, um, we're all, you know, leading a life. We all have our own commitments, and we're all trying to do whatever we can to the best of our ability. Just like we say, no mother is perfect and every child is different. I think every individual is different. Even twins don't think the same way. Yeah. And one way by which objectification can be looked at in a much more positive manner is, I think, social media, where we are today. Everybody has a smartphone, right? The, the tips of their fingers. I mean, news just spreads like wildfire, be it good or bad. Um, I recently saw a bridal ad of Alia Bhatt, which I really liked. And I was surprised to read that there's a controversy around that as well. You know, it's called, um, instead of Kanya Daan, it's called Kanya Mahan, where yeah. the mother-in-law gives the hand of the groom in her hand. It was such a wonderful, positive, gesture. Yeah. innovative gesture. I think, you know, it can travel a long way. It's it's about not just welcoming the bride into the family, but sending the groom to be a part of the other family exactly. as well. So yeah. I think, uh, you know, a lot more positivity around not just talking about women empowerment, but actually doing it, showing mm -hmm. it, simple gestures, yeah. small, you know, words of appreciation from one woman to the other or, you know, from one person to the other, yeah, leave the alone person. man and woman here. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, a small, simple word of acknowledgement, appreciation, just patting the back and saying, hey, you're doing a great job. Trust me, that will go a very long way. And I Agreed. think social media, very powerful tool, which when used well, can, can do, do wonders. wonders. Mm. But unfortunately, not every time it is used in the right manner. You know what I mean? So um, more articles, more discussions, more workshops. Um, mm. 
more awareness, know. more conversations, yeah. right? More yeah. conversations and we'll get there someday. Some and I think these conversations, it's high time we start having these conversations on a gender neutral basis. Man, That's woman, right. everybody has to be, even That's right. the LGBT community, we need that inclusion everywhere. Only right. then we'll have that level of empathy for one and all around us. Uh, one right. last comment. Uh, Shri writes that depends totally on us and how we take that objectification. Yes. We can positively get influenced sometimes, though. Obviously, Shri, thank you for the comment. Yeah. Definitely, we can choose to be if we want to get positively or negatively objectified, right? Um, on that note, ladies, thank you so much for your time. This was an Pleasure. amazing conversation to have. Thank this was very enlightening. Yeah. No, no, it, the pleasure is all mine. And we had a lot to take away from both of your thought processes and to all our audiences and listeners first of all thank you for your very important comments and thoughts we appreciate them and i hope you've got a lot to take away from what these ladies had to share thank you for watching us we'll be back shortly with another episode on chai chat and community till then stay safe stay well and we'll meet you soon have a good night everyone thank you thank you